Boxing Ego here. If you like this video, make sure you hit the like button and also subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon on the top of your screen to get notified when the latest new content drops. One. Teddy Atlas put Vasil Lomachenko as pound for pound number one. Uh? What up, Fight World? It's your boy Ego, and I'm back with some more boxing. Make sure you smash the like button. Also, subscribe to the channel for the latest and greatest in boxing. If you want to become part of the notification gang, gang, hit the bell icon. Shout out to the Super Chats, the channel donations, and the Patreon family we work in. Now, I'm back home now. Back in California. I love California. And I was in Nebraska, both Omaha and Lincoln, for the Crawford and Dongo fight. Had a great week. Uh, feels good to be back. Felt good to sleep in my own bed. I was there for five days, I think it is. So, these trips get kind of long sometimes. But... I had fun there and met a lot of good people, network, you know, the usual. Now, I was at the fight, covered the fight, media, and I guess Teddy Atlas has said something, but I don't like to speak on things that I am not aware of. And when you're at the fight, you can't actually hear what's being said. Now that I've had time to settle and catch up, basically, to see what was said, the gist of it is Teddy Atlas did a pound for pound list. And on his pound for pound list, he rated Vasil Lomachenko in at number one. He says Vasil Lomachenko is pound for pound number one. And a lot of people were rubbed the wrong way by that. Um, not beating around the bush or sugarcoating. And a lot of people were like, what? How does that even make sense? <clears throat> <clears throat> he put Andre Ward in at number two. Crawford at three, Keith Thurman at four, and Errol Spence at number five, right? And ESPN messed up because in the they had the flag of where the person is from. So Lomachenko had the Ukraine flag, Crawford, Ward, Thurman, they all had American flag. But for Errol Spence, instead of him having the American flag, since he's from Texas, the Soto, Texas, they put a Cuban flag. So ESPN, whoever's doing the on-screen graphics, Drop the ball because Errol Spence is not from Viva Cubano. Like he's not Cuban. So that made no sense. But speaking of make no sense, I cannot agree with Teddy Atlas's assessment. And I think a lot of the boxing world, unless you're a fanboy or egregious, and I'm going to break this down and I'm not going to keep doing this. Um, I just want to state my opinion for those who care and who, who are on this subject. So like i said some people because this is the thing with me i don't care who's mad i'm gonna say what i honestly feel just like teddy atlas just like jim lampley bang bang all that they can say whatever they want donald trump can say whatever he want um andre ward or whoever they can speak their mind broner can say what he wants so guess what ego can say what he wants also and i respect teddy atlas i i think he's a great boxing brain I think he's um, done a lot for the sport. He definitely has knowledge. But the reason I disagree with his list is because I was talking to Ward about this. Ward, we were interviewing, and he said that um, basically Teddy Atlas was encompassing the amateur pedigree and all that into his personal pound for pound list. This is exactly why I tell you guys that I don't even bother with the pound for pound list because somewhere someone out there somewhere will agree with it and then there'll be others that don't they'll be like oh why would you put him why would you put Errol Spence he only has one you know what I'm saying so it's not even worth my time to be honest and I'm not trying to like big dog nobody but it's really not because one it's constantly changing two there's other factors like heavyweight since you can't really move up from heavyweight that's like the top of the totem pole in terms of weight class other guys like Mayweather and Pacquiao moving up five, eight divisions, some people would never put a heavyweight on there just because they can't move up. And a lot of them, unless you're like Evander Holyfield or Steve Cunningham or whatever, a lot of them didn't start at cruiserweight and then move up to heavyweight. So most of the guys that are heavyweight, like Wilder, Klitschko, to my knowledge, they never fought. I'm not talking about when they're like teenagers. I'm talking about in their adult life, they never fought under heavyweight. You know what I'm saying? So... It, there's too many factors plus it would always be changing because you would have to look at 
Like, let's say you have Roman Chuck Latito, then he lost his fight. Crawford just became undisputed, so you would constantly be moving and shifting things around. But I think when it comes to the top dogs, it's very, very easy. Like, when Floyd was it, everybody knew Floyd was number one. It just goes without saying. So even though I don't take the time, it's not because I don't have an opinion on it. It's just it would always it's just too many factors into it. But when it when you're talking about the top guys, it's usually pretty easy to sift through them. And I can even understand making a sound logical argument for like one guy over the other. But the reason for me and I, like I said, I'm not going to keep doing these videos talking about it unless y'all want me to. I could talk all day. That's what I get paid to do. You know what I mean? But the reason I can't put Lomachenko because, and I totally disagree with Teddy Atlas, is because explain this to me. How is it that in Teddy Atlas's top three, listen to me, his top three pound for pound guys, the number one person is the only person in the top three with a loss? That right there from me, I'm a realist. I try to think logically like fuck emotion and passion all that uh, favorite all that so that to me doesn't make sense that's one issue how is the only person in the top three have a loss and it's not even really a disputed loss like like you could say kovalev lost to ward some people disputed that i did not thought ward won but it was a close tight fight i will admit that you know what i mean badu jack versus james de Gale. okay that was a, a disputed draw i thought badu jack won you know what i'm saying so i can understand if it was something like that but that's not the case lomachenko they got a little too big for their bridges they thought based on having nearly 400 fights and being 400 amateur fights and being a phenomenal fighter that they could just jump into the pro ranks and do and defy the laws of attraction or whatever you want to call it and be the gamey veteran who's willing to win by any means necessary in their second fight against Orlando Salido and they came up short. You could say, oh, he was overweight, he fought dirty, but the point being is he stepped up and he lost. You could say he got better after that. I don't have any beef with that because those are all things that you could say are pretty much factual. Like, oh, he does look like he's gotten better, but the fact remains he has a loss on paper. You know what I'm saying? He has a loss that we can't really even dispute. So to me, that right there is a huge red flag. How is your pound for pound, your top guy have a loss and then the, the guys who are underneath him have more fights, 30, 30 plus fights, and they don't have a loss. And you you break down the, the semantics and whatnot, Lomachenko has two gold medals, so he stayed in the amateur circuit. Ward has a gold medal also in the Olympics, so he has one. Terrence Crawford has an amateur pedigree, not a gold medalist, but he has an amateur pedigree where he's beaten guys like Mikey Garcia and Danny Garcia in the amateurs, right? So he's he's not like a new kid on the block, like he just started boxing. He was winning golden gloves, silver gloves, nationals, and stuff like that too, right? So Lomachenko, okay, he has one more medal than Andre Ward. But they've all moved up. But you look at who they moved up for. Lomachenko moved up and beat Rocky Martinez, who I thought lost to Salido in the rematch. And then they robbed him. I thought Rocky Martinez also lost his fight with um, Juan Carlos Borgos way back when. And they said it was a draw and let him retain the title. So there's, there's a couple faulty things with martinez even being a champion plus mikey garcia had already stopped them you cannot say the same for who andre ward moved up and fought he moved up his first fight at the full light heavyweight and fought sullivan barrera not only did he beat him but he outclassed him and he knocked him down right i was there i covered the fight live in addition to that sullivan barrera showed his tenacity by bouncing back very nicely nobody really wanted to fight him he was calling out jean pascal for a while couldn't get that then golden boy struck a deal with him with their prospect who they were building and was undefeated big puncher who everybody was talking about how he dropped alexander brand a guy that went the distance with um andre ward he dropped him in sparring so it was like oh shabransky everybody check out this brand okay guess what they traded knockdowns. I think Sullivan Brewer got knocked down once, but he knocked down Shabransky three times and stopped him 
and blemished his record when he was undefeated. Then he comes back and breaks Joe Smith Jr.'s jaw and beats Joe Smith Jr., who had some traction by beating Andres Van Favre via first round stoppage and he knocked Bernard Hopkins out of the fucking galaxy and he flew through the ring like he was in a rocking chair and he fell and tipped over. You know what I'm saying? So that was two back to back wins. Actually he had another fight in between that Sullivan Brer did. So he had three three solid wins. And this is after Andre Ward. So that's Ward. Terrence Crawford, he beat Ricky Burns and beat Beltran. There weren't top names for him at thirty five. He fought Bradis Prescott Moved up on two weeks' notice, schooled him, a guy who knocked out Amir Khan, right? See, I could do this all day. Then there weren't too many names for Crawford at 135. Guess what he did? He moved up like a big boy. He moved up to 145, Thomas Delorme. I thought he was losing some of the early rounds. I don't know if he was just waiting or, or whatever, but he was losing. And then out of nowhere, he turns it up on Delorme and stops him, right? And he just shows that separation. Then he beats Hank Lundy and Dierry Jean, you know what I mean? He beats uh, another Olympic gold medalist, Felix Diaz, easily. He's like knocking on his head, playing patty cake with his head. That's an like Olympic gold medalist we're talking about. He beat a puncher and John Molina, stopped him, something Broner didn't do. Um, then he fights Julius Ndongo and Victor Postal, guys who are taller than him, guys who are also champions, guys who are perceived as 50-50, 60-40 fights. And despite being at a height and reach disadvantage he dominates them and he stops one of them julius and dongo which was i was i was actually at both fights postal and in dongo and i think he could have stopped postal but postal wasn't really trying to he didn't really want no work he wasn't really willing to engage and dongo was game as hell and he was swinging for the fences it's kind of wild and he got caught he got caught with the vicious body shot so when i look at it it just doesn't make sense because, like I said, they've all moved up. But look at who they moved up and fought. You know what I mean? Lomachenko fought Nicholas Walters, which is a solid name. But Walters, to me, didn't have as much momentum as people think. Because Walters was coming off a draw. I thought he won that fight. But nonetheless, it was a tougher fight than most people expected with Jason Sosa. Right? And he had a long layoff where he gained some weight. And then he fought Lomachenko. You know, and he looked like he wasn't even really there. Like he, he was just kind of collecting a paycheck. He was very um, easy to quit and look for a way out. You know what I mean? So that didn't look like typical Walters. I mean, whatever. I'm not making an excuse. I'm just telling you what it is. Like he just looked like shit the whole fight. Jason Sosa, same thing. He was kind of game for the first round. Then Lomachenko turned it up on him. No match. Madiaga. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like. I, I can't agree with Teddy Atlas's list. And then somebody said, by far, one of the dumbest statements that I talked about in live stream. One of the dumbest statements that I've ever heard. And he says, the reason, he's like, this makes perfect sense that Lomachenko will be number one pound for pound. I said, how? He says, because when you look at it, he has the hardest style to beat. Okay, so... The thing is, I don't just have an opinion and I'm just like, I'm going to stick to my guns no matter what anyone says. If you offer something, if you bring something new to the table and I'm like scratching my head like, wow, that's a very good point. I can understand where you're coming from. That's different. You know what I mean? So I'm not like stuck in, the, you know what I mean? Stuck in cement where I'm like, no, I'm not budging no matter what. If you bring something new. And I'm like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I see where you're coming from. That's cool. But the way my brain is set up, you have to do that for me to, if I've already made the, the proper, um, in my opinion, the proper um, decision and I've collected data and I'm looking at it, then to change that is going to take some form of logic. So listening to what the person said, and this is why I said it was dumb, is because once again, Lomachenko out of the top three on Teddy Atlas's pound for pound is the only person with the loss. So how can you say his style is the hardest to beat when he's been beaten? That doesn't even make sense. Andre Ward undefeated. You go, oh, Kovalev was close, but he still lost. Kovalev still lost. You know what I'm saying? So despite what you're talking about, the judges gave it to him by one round, I think it was, on all three judges' scorecard. So that was indicative of what I seen. I was at the fight. It was indicative of what I seen. A guy got knocked down, did better in the second half once he got his bearings back and got into a rhythm and dug himself out of a hole for a very tight and close fight. That's what I seen. 
You know what I'm saying? So you can't, it's not a robbery when it's a super close fight like that. You know what I mean? And all judges, you didn't see any way out scorecards like Canelo versus Lada, 117 to 111. I think they had it like 114, 113 on three judges' scorecards. That's fair. You know what I'm saying? So how can you say Lomachenko's style is hardest to beat when Crawford is just destroying gold medalists like, like it's nothing, eating them like Lunchables? You know what I mean? Fighting guys who are taller, Postal and Indongos and shit, who against other people, their boxing ability is is superb and sufficient. You know what I mean? They're getting the job done. And then Crawford, they get in there with him and get gun shy or get stopped. Or, you know what I'm saying? So how can you say Lomachenko's style is the hardest to beat when he's been beaten? That doesn't even make sense to me. That's like me saying Amir Khan is the hardest welterweight to knock out when he's been knocked out. That You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense to me. Like, if you say Errol Spence or Keith Thurman or Floyd or whoever is the hardest to knock out at welterweight, you you know what I mean? You, got, you have a leg to stand on because those guys haven't been knocked out yet. You know what I mean? Thurman got hurt versus Colazzo, but he didn't get knocked down. He didn't even get knocked out. He didn't get knocked down, anything like that. You know what I'm saying? But you can't say Khan or Manny Pacquiao is the hardest to knock out when the motherfuckers have been knocked out. See? So if you, you want to battle with this stuff and have an intelligent boxing conversation, you have to come with something. And see, this is what happens. I told y'all in January, it was not going to be a good year for you. And I've made damn sure that that was the case. You know what I mean? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. You got to tell the truth. And the thing is, a lot of the casuals... The problem with what they do is they don't think about the point from start to finish. They just say the shit and then they get backed into a corner because when you start exploring what they said, what they claim they like and what they what they're telling the universe and telling the public, it just doesn't make sense. Like I said, you can't say Lomachenko has the hardest style to beat when the motherfucker's been beat. And finally, Lomachenko himself said Crawford is number one. And the only reason he probably didn't say Andre Ward is number one is because he's friends with Kovalev and that's his boy. And Kovalev got beaten twice by him. And he tried, I seen an interview where he was kind of disputing it in the first fight and then saying the ref should have gave him more time with the low blows and stuff like that. So of course he's probably not gonna put Andre Ward up there, but that to me, that's kind of like a personal bias. You, you clearly have a friendship with that person and like, I'm, I'm cool with Ward. Ward knows me, first name basis and stuff like that. However, the difference is I don't have to show any bias. Like Ward's doing the work. He's, he's making my job easy. So for me to put him in a pound for pound number one spot, it's very easy because his, his pedigree is showing you that. Gold medal, moved up in weight, fighting guys that are bigger than him. I, like to me, and that's the other thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the in the video after that, is both Crawford and Ward have fought, to me, guys who were bigger than them that were known for having some skill, like Crawford, I just said, and Dongo and Postal. Um, when I covered the Sullivan Barrera fight with Andre Ward, Andre Ward didn't look like a fully developed light heavyweight. You know what I'm saying? He was in shape, but he didn't look, Sullivan Barrera looked bigger. You know what I'm saying? He looked big. And Sullivan Barrera just looked like, even though they, they may, both made weight, Sullivan Barrera looked like the bigger man. You know what I mean? And also Kovalev. Kovalev looked a little bit taller than Ward and way more fights at light heavyweight. But for Vasil Lomachenko, he looks bigger than a lot of opponents. He looks a lot bigger than, than Mariagas and Jason Sosa. Just look at the face-offs. You'll be able to tell. He looked bigger than them guys. He's going to look bigger than Riga now if the fight actually is 100% done. So that's just my two cents on it. I had to break it down. Again, I wasn't able to break it down because I was actually covering the fight. And like I said, I like Teddy Atlas, but at, it, it comes to a point where it's like, man, it, is, it seems like, are they ESPN telling you to incorporate this or is this what you honestly feel? Because like I said, from a logical perspective for me, I don't have any ties to Rock Nation or Top Rank or Go To Boy, PBC or whatever. You know what I mean? Other than covering their events and um, just being a professional through and throughout. But I don't have anybody putting a battery in my back telling me like, oh, you have to promote this fighter only or you have to push our agenda. You know what I'm saying? So that's the great thing about this platform, YouTube and stuff, is you have the creative control. So I don't know. 
I don't know what it is behind the scenes. I don't know if Teddy Atlas really feels that way or if ESPN is kind of telling him, hey, we got to promote Lomachenko because he's going to fight Reagan now. So you, you put him there or mix it up to create controversy because stuff like that does happen. I know someone who used to do, I don't know, the stylist or something for reality shows and some of that stuff be scripted. Like some of the stuff where it looks like argument, the producers jump in like behind the scenes and be like, hey, make sure you, you, you put up a fit when you FaceTime call this person or, or whatever the situation is because they're after ratings. So I don't know. And it's hard to tell. Cause like I said, I think I respect Teddy Atlas. I just interviewed him. He's a great guy, but I can't agree with that, that pound for pound list. And I kind of broke it down in a 20 minute video why. You, you can't say a guy's style is the hardest to beat when he's been beaten. That's that's one of the easiest points to make. You know what I mean? And a guy that has 10 fights, you can't tell me he, you've seen more than that than a guy with 60 fights. Or two fighters that, between the two of them, they have 60, 60 plus fights. The last thing is the amateur pedigree. The, like, like, I would tear down this argument. Lomachenko has by far one of the best amateurs, if not, let's say he's the best amateur ever you know what i mean 396 wins one loss that he avenged that's a great record and i think he avenged that loss twice beat the guy twice that beat him right that's a great hell of a record but guess what you got to break it down in realistic segments and if everyone's praising lomachenko's amateur record right which it is praiseworthy i'm not saying that but you got to listen to this if his amateur record is so impressive and so great, then why did he lose his second pro fight to a guy that Yorkis Gamboa beat easily? Mikey Garcia beat fairly easily. You know what I'm saying? And that was Mikey Garcia's first big step up in class. So obviously there were some kinks and things he had to work out as a pro. So that amateur versus pro stuff doesn't really correlate 100%. Another case in point, you look at Terrence Crawford, a guy that, to my knowledge, didn't go to the Olympics, yet he's destroying gold medalists like Felix Diaz and Yuri Urkis Gamboa, guys who did medal in the Olympics. So the amateur thing is great, but the amateurs is the amateurs. It's just no different than if you cut ties with the former employer and you no longer work at that job and you go to a new job, that's cool to put on your resume, like, oh, I work for this company for, I work for, you know what I mean, PayPal or Google for um, six years, but now you work at Apple, so you have to be in line with their mission statements, their visions, and like I said, it's a good um, point on your resume, something to put on your resume, but it doesn't mean you'll be successful at the next company because you were so successful at the last company, because they have different directives and goals and different people in charge and stuff like that you know what i mean maybe the pacing is faster or slower at one of the jobs you know what i'm saying the pay is different so you got to factor that in and again lomachenko has a great amateur pedigree but if it was so great then why did he lose to a guy who has several losses even stoppage losses early in his career let me know your thoughts drop your thoughts in the comment section i just broke it down just my thoughts. Make sure you smash the like button. As always, hate, comment, and subscribe. Till next video is Ego signing off. So if you enjoyed this video and want more content like this on the channel, you can show your appreciation by going to the PayPal donate button or the YouTube support button. And you can donate any amount that you feel is equivalent to the value of this video. Much more to come. Thank you guys for your support. Boxing Ego, the future of boxing.